What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be diving into all of the types of off flavors in beer and how will you prevent them and or fix them. Which of these can you fix and which can you not? So hopefully we'll answer that question today without uh, getting too wrapped up in the details. But uh, without further ado, let's dive into it. The first and probably the most important point I wanna make here though is that if you are just generally using good sanitation practices, cleaning your equipment regularly, pitching enough healthy yeast, and fermenting at the right temperatures, 99.9% .9 of these beer off flavors will never occur in your brew house. So if you've ever had like maybe a friend's home brew or a family member's home brew when they just started, or maybe when you were just starting, you had a batch of home brew that just was like, had this generic home brew flavor. Like it's just not easy to identify exactly what's wrong with it, but it doesn't taste like it should and kind of does taste like it was made in the bathtub. 99% of the time, that je ne sais quoi homebrew flavor is a combination of oxidation, acetaldehyde, and fusel alcohols. These are easily three of the most common off flavors that you'll encounter in homebrewing if you're not using proper brewing practices. We'll talk about all three of these right away since they are the most common. Oxidation is the first one on the list. Oxidation is what happens when your beer is exposed to the open air after fermentation uh, for a period of time. This can happen if you open the fermenter and you know maybe when you're dry hopping or when you're transferring into a different container or when you're packaging your beer or if you leave additional headspace in either your keg or your bottles that's not purged with CO2. Um, it's a very easy thing to have happen, but it's also a very easy thing to prevent. I have made a video all about oxidation and how to fix it or prevent it. Uh, I'm gonna link that video up in the corner if you wanna check out more details on that subject. But the main thing to pay attention to is just try to avoid opening your fermenter. Try to flush everything with CO2 if you can and do closed transfers where you can. The second off flavor is gonna be fusel alcohols, which is like a solventy, sharp alcoholic character in a beer. Um, and sometimes it's a very unpleasant character. And if you've ever drank a homebrew that tastes kind of like jet fuel, it's that's what it is. Um, these are notorious for really giving you a nasty hangover after drinking only a few beers. Basically, fusel alcohols will really only occur when you have a bad fermentation. So that's not pitching enough yeast relative to the gravity of the beer. If you're impatient and your beer isn't cooling down enough before you pitch it and you're pitching, uh, a few degrees too hot, that's a great way to get fusel alcohols in the beer. Unfortunately, fusel alcohols are pretty much impossible to get rid of unless you restart fermentation. They will eventually convert into esters over time if you let the beer age enough. Uh, so that is one way to get rid of it, but it'll take months for that to happen. But another option is to add in some sugar and add in some fresh yeast to scrub out those fusel alcohols. Sometimes the fresh yeast activity can convert those fusels into esters as well. It's not a 100% solution because sometimes that'll cause an autolysis off flavor, but it is definitely one way to cut down on the sharpness. And the third super common one is acetaldehyde. Uh, this is that green apple flavor that you might get sometimes. And potentially it's also a soury fruity flavor as well. It manifests itself a bit differently depending on the kind of beer it appears in. 99% uh, of the time this is due to the beer being prematurely packaged, packaged too young. Um, or you're not using enough yeast, again, in your fermentation. Nine times out of 10, acetaldehyde will go away with time. If you let your beer condition at room temperature for a few weeks, the active yeast in the beer itself will actually metabolize that acetaldehyde and get rid of it, or at least reduce it to lower than flavor threshold levels. That's fortunately one of those off flavors that's easy to get rid of. The next one that's pretty common uh, is diacetyl. So diacetyl is kind of a buttery, um, kind of rotten vegetable character that shows up in beer if the fermentation is finished prematurely. Um, it's also something that happens when you don't pitch enough yeast. Once again, big theme here, pitch enough yeast. It can happen sometimes also when you ferment a little too hot. So American and English ale yeasts are pretty notorious for dumping out a lot of diacetyl if they're fermented a little too warm, along with a lot of nice, disgusting, rotten fruit esters. It helps to ferment at the right temperature, uh, as well as to add enough yeast. Diacetyl will also form in the beer if you rush the beer along and you package before the fermentation is really truly complete. It'll happen to manifest itself a couple weeks after you've actually gotten it in the keg or in the bottles. 
it is relatively easy to get rid of, usually a good amount of time at a uh, temperature around room temperature, so 68 to 72 Fahrenheit, will get rid of that diacetyl in a couple weeks once the fermentation's finished. The next one is DMS. Um, everyone likes to think that this is a common off flavor, but I actually really don't think it's very common. DMS comes about from uh, mostly pale malts or Pilsner malts. Is it a compound known as SMM that is a precursor to DMS, and it's a much a uh, higher concentration of that in things like Pilsner malts and lighter kilned malts um, than in other types of malts. It's kind of an old brewing myth that when you're brewing a Pilsner or something like that, that you have to boil it for like 90 minutes to get rid of DMS. Um, the thing is, modern maltsters nowadays have improved their malting techniques to allow for a much, much lower amount of SMM in their Pilsner malts, which then results in a much lower amount of DMS. Most times, if you boil your beer for about 30 minutes, you're gonna get rid of all of that DMS, or at least bring it down below the flavor threshold, uh, and that's all you really need to worry about. There's a number of reasons why uh, long boils are beneficial for a beer. DMS removal is certainly one of them, but don't feel like you have to boil everything for 60 or 90 minutes if you don't want to. However, if you do end up with DMS in your final beer, it's very likely it's not going to go away, so that's unfortunately gonna stick around with you for the entire beer. Um, the next off flavor is tannic. Tannic comes from like a uh, harsh and astringent kind of character. Everyone describes it as sucking on a tea bag, which is not something I'd ever recommend doing. If you get kind of like a black tea character or like a very tannic, harsh red wine character in a beer, that's what that is. Usually it comes from the mash pH being too high, uh, but it can also come from boiling the husks of grains or sparging too hot, uh, and also can show up if you're boiling spices for too long. Unfortunately, that's another one that is gonna stay in your beer and not really go away um, if it does end up in the beer. The next off flavor is scorching. Uh, so scorching happens really it, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. It happens either when the grain itself is scorched either by heating on the mash when it's too low or when sugar is burned onto an element or onto the bottom of the kettle. Uh, both of these things are gonna result in an ashtray-like flavor in your beer. It is absolutely horrible. Um, it will not go away either. And the best way to prevent this from happening is really just to avoid heating your mash too quickly when you have grain in there. If you're step mashing, make sure you are not heating a high protein mash uh, at a lower temperature, like doing a protein rest, with an electric element providing the heat. Use a boiling water infusion to actually meet those temperatures instead, and that will avoid the scorching process. For some reason, it's a lot more susceptible to scorching at lower temperatures with a higher protein grist. Also, if you're brewing with like candy sugar or dextrose or something like that, don't add those sugars at the beginning of the boil. Add them closer to the end, about 10 minutes from the end. That will prevent them from scorching and over caramelizing uh, on the elements or on your kettle bottom if it's direct fired. The next one is light struck or skunked beer. Um, so this happens if your beer is exposed to UV light and it can happen in a matter of seconds. So if you've ever been to like a beer garden and you're drinking a beer outside and you know, all of a sudden your craft Pilsner turns into Heineken, that's what happened. Your beer was exposed to direct sunlight for about five seconds and suddenly you are tasting a skunked beer. This also can happen if your beer is stored in a uh, transparent container, so like a green bottle or a clear bottle, or um, you have a fermenter that's been exposed to the, like a carboy or a plastic fermenter that's been exposed to the light. Try to avoid having those things happen um, and you will avoid skunking your beer prior to actually tasting it. Most of the time, this only happens when you pour your beer and it's exposed to the light. Um, and it's also a flavor characteristic of certain types of beer like Heineken, like Corona, that are served in these um, transparent containers. If you've ever had the canned version of Heineken, it's very different than the bottled version of Heineken and it's because of that skunking process. Unfortunately, Again, not a flavor that you can remove from the beer once it's in there. The next one is chlorophenols. Um, this is when you have that Band-Aid flavor or like a flavor of like a strong cleaner almost in a beer. Sometimes it also manifests as kind of a medicinal flavor as well. Uh, it's a type of very strong phenol. Sometimes it comes from the yeast strain that you're using, but most of the time the responsible culprit is either chlorine or chloramines in your brewing water. So if you are brewing with tap water, this is a very real possibility. If you've ever had a beer come out that tastes like that, that shouldn't taste like that, 
um, then it's possible that you have that issue. It will not go away once it's in your beer, but it is easy to prevent before you even start brewing. Either ensure that you're using chlorine-free water or add in potassium metabisulfate, which is a Camden tablet, to the water prior to brewing. Or you can leave it out overnight and let that chlorine naturally evaporate out of the brewing water. These are all good ways to prevent that from happening. Basically what happens is the chlorine and the yeast interact, creating these chlorophenols, which taste like absolute crap. Another thing that can happen is if you're one of those folks that decides that they want to use bleach to sanitize with, um, the chlorine in bleach will also create chlorophenols if you do not rinse it all off appropriately. The next one is a metallic off flavor. This happens most often due to using like old grain or having um, like little pits in your stainless fermenting uh, equipment or your stainless brewing equipment. If you have small amounts of rust in your kettle, you're gonna start getting uh, some metallic flavors in your beer. It can also happen if you're brewing with aluminum or a different grade of stainless steel other than 304, um, something that is more perceptible to actual uh, rusting. This can also happen if you don't passivate your stainless steel once you first get it. Uh, that's gonna be an important step for any type of stainless steel brewing so you can avoid having those rust spots in the first place. Usually I found this one will sometimes go away with time. The next one is sulfur. This one's pretty common. I experience a lot of sulfur in beers when they're packaged prematurely. Um, it's really nothing to worry about. It's just some sulfur dioxide gas that's produced. Sometimes this happens when you add potassium metabisulfate uh, to a beer as well. The easiest way to get rid of this is simply to let the beer sit around and condition a bit longer. Just time is gonna help this one. But if you're impatient about it, it's actually a really cool method. You can toss a penny into the keg or into the fermenter. The copper in the penny actually scrubs the sulfur out entirely. It's actually really cool. But another way to do it, if you don't wanna add anything or open up the uh, fermenter or the keg, is just to simply get the beer slightly carbonated, open the PRV and let the carbonation all out, and then that will actually cause the gases in the beer to express themselves out, fill that headspace. Then like a day later, you can open that PRV again, purge again, and that sulfur will probably be gone. It's a lot more common with lager yeasts than it is with ale yeasts, but 99% of the time, it's gonna be an easy thing to remove from your beer. The next off flavor is a sourness or a baby vomit character. There's really no way around this one, like sour beer when it shouldn't be sour or vomit-like beer when it shouldn't, when it never should taste like vomit. Um, that's an infection, either from lactobacillus or from butyric acid. Both of these things are bacterial infections. Both of these are very easy to prevent by simply having good sanitation practices and good cleaning practices. Once they're in your beer though, you're not getting rid of them. They're gonna be there for a long time. Just make sure you're checking in the nooks and the crannies of your fermenters. Take your valves apart and clean and sanitize those. Be sure you're taking your taps apart and cleaning those, cleaning the lines in your kegerator um, if you use a kegerator, and just being sure you're cleaning all of those surfaces. Be sure you're uh, flushing out your chillers and cleaning those as well. Those are all spots that bacteria like to hang out and can be a source of infection. The next uh, off flavor is excessively fruity or excessively phenolic. This is esters or phenols. This comes from either choosing the wrong kind of yeast for a beer style or fermenting that yeast at too high or too low of a temperature. The easiest way to prevent this is just to choose the right yeast for the style and choose the right fermentation temperatures for the style. Um, the most common time this shows up is in like American and English ales. When you're fermenting like USO5 at 75 degrees or you know SO4 for example at 75 degrees, it gives you these really rotten fruit characters that are just not palatable. Um, and that's an ester. It comes entirely from the yeast. But also, uh, conversely, if you have maybe a Hefeweizen or, or a Belgian ale and you're fermenting those in the low 60s, you're gonna get a ton of clove character and phenolics. Um, and if it's excessively phenolic, it can almost taste like the Band-Aid chlorophenol character that I mentioned before. Um, so like WBO6 is very notorious for this. Um, these are known as phenolic off flavors. So if you are looking at your yeast and you see uh, POF plus, that means phenolic off flavor positive. It means that yeast is capable of creating an excessive amount of phenols if you don't ferment it at the right temperatures. Um, so that's a useful thing to look out for if you're choosing yeast strains and you want to avoid that. That being said, phenolics are an important part of some beer styles like Hefeweizen's and like Belgian ales. So it could in some cases actually be appropriate for the type of beer. 
With those excessive esters and excessive phenols, usually you can actually dampen them over time by lagering them or keeping them uh, in storage for a long time. So I'm gonna actually combine the next two off flavors here into one. And this is husky or grainy and astringent off flavors. Both of these are primarily due to mash pH being too high. They tend to come through very similar to that black tea kind of tannic character. Um, astringency is a very powerful, strong kind of bitterness um, that is very unpleasant and unpalatable. And you get that sometimes from having too many roasted grains in uh, a beer or mashing those roasted grains for a long period of time. Uh, it causes this strong bitterness and it's a very unpleasant character. The husky grainy flavor can come in a very similar vein from using too many toasted malts. Um, these are things like victory malt or uh, special roast or something like that. They're slightly less than chocolate malt, but more so than caramel malts, but they can come from some of the darker caramel malts as well. So not only limiting the amount of these kinds of malts in your beers, but also ensuring that you are getting the right mash pH will help you avoid many of these problems. But another nice thing I like to do to help avoid astringency in stouts and porters when I have a lot of those roasted grains in there is actually just to add those dark malts in the last 15 minutes of the mash because you really only need them for color and ideally like a hint of flavor um, so that helps get that color in there that helps get that nice hint of roasted flavor um, and it keeps it from being too strong autolysis is the next off flavor uh, and this usually manifests itself as a soy sauce flavor um, it is not a great one. That autolysis flavor is actually the umami character in soy sauce. And it works really well for food, but not necessarily for beer. It's not a very common homebrew flavor, but it has happened to me in stronger beers. Uh, I had a Russian Imperial Stout that had an autolysis issue because uh, I didn't pitch enough yeast into it. Uh, it was one of the many issues with that beer. The best way to avoid autolysis is to pitch enough yeast, to pitch enough healthy yeast into your fermentation. The other thing about autolysis too is that it can happen if you leave your beer on a yeast cake for a long, long time, like on the order of months. Um, so for home brewers, it's not as big of an issue as it is for pro brewers because there's a lot more volume involved and a lot more yeast involved. But if it does happen to you, it is probably not going to go away, unfortunately. Uh, you can try pitching in some fresh yeast that might clean it up, but 99% of the time, it's gonna be dead yeast. You wanna get it off that dead yeast and then try to give it some time and give it some fresh yeast. So the next off flavor to talk about is cidery. So this is a non-alcoholic apple cider um, cidery flavor is going to taste very similar to this, just minus that added sweetness. Um, it would taste more like a dry cider, almost like the hard cider I made a couple months ago. The root issue of that is adding in too many simple sugars into the fermentation. So adding in too many flavorless sugars are going to result in a cidery character. Sugars that leave a residual flavor in the beer are actually going to be better for this. They'll help prevent a cidery character because there'll be a flavor remaining behind. But the rule of thumb usually is you don't want to exceed one or two pounds of sugar in a five gallon batch uh, to avoid this cidery character. Uh, it also can be aggravated by certain kinds of yeasts. Excessively estery yeasts are going to create cider-like flavors. Specifically, Belgian yeasts are very, very notorious for pumping out lots of like citrus character that can be confused for a cider flavor. Um, but rest assured that it's actually a yeast derived thing. If you have too much of a cidery character in your beer, it can also combine with acetaldehyde, which has a green apple flavor, and that can cause even more kind of cidery character. Regardless, the best way to fix this really is just to give it some time, pitch enough yeast, and uh, just it may age out over time. The next flavor is grassiness or mustiness. Grassy character can come about from dry hopping too long, adding too much vegetal material into the entire beer. Um, that's pretty much the most common cause of that flavor. However, it does work in some types of beer and it works with some types of hops. Uh, but the musty character really comes from having old hops or using old grain. Um, so usually you can avoid this problem by just making sure your ingredients are fresh. That's not that hard to do. If you do buy your grains in bulk and you keep them, just be sure you're not crushing them and then storing them for a long time. Only crush them on brew day or a few days prior that gets the most freshness out of those malts and avoids that mustiness. The next off flavor is mold. Um, really, if you get a moldy, mildewy, damp kind of dank character in a beer, you might have a mold problem. Um, 
Most likely you would have seen it um, if you peeked into your fermenter at all or have a clear fermenter and you can see what's growing on the surface. If there is a green, white, or hopefully not black fuzziness on the uh, surface of the wort, you might have a mold problem. It's happened once or twice to me, actually. I do brew in a basement, which is a naturally damp place. It's an ideal environment for mold to form. Um, and every so often I get a little bit of white mold on the surface of a beer. It's actually not that hard to just take the beer out from underneath uh, that layer and then leave a good inch or so of the wort on top. It doesn't actually seem to affect it too much unless you leave the mold in there for a long time. It can also show up in valves and connections though, so be sure you're taking all your stuff apart uh, when you're cleaning. That being said, is it safe to drink a beer that has mold in it? If it's white, yes. It's actually not gonna be a big deal. White mold's harmless. If it's green, sometimes green mold can make you sick, so be careful. But if you see black mold in your fermenter, black mold is extremely dangerous. But not only are you gonna need to throw out that fermenter probably, but you're also gonna want to look into a mold abatement for where you live. The next off flavor is soapiness. This has happened once or twice to me. Um, the main culprit here is actually some certain varieties of hops. Um, I actually find it most commonly with Cascade. The composition of some hop oils can cause soapiness uh, depending on when you're using them. Um, so I found if I use Cascade in the Whirlpool for some reason it ends up being soapy. I'm not sure why. It's a little bit annoying, um, but if you use the right kinds of other hops it can uh, prevent it from being a major issue. But it also can happen if you're cleaning your brewing equipment with like a dish soap or any other type of soap based cleaner that will leave residual soapy flavor in the beer. Try to avoid doing that at all costs. Just stick with the tried and true cleaners, PBW to clean and Star Sand to sanitize. They're both flavorless when used properly. The final off flavor we're gonna cover here today, finally made it to the end, congratulations, thanks for still watching. <laughs> the final off flavors are a unbalanced beer. So that's cloying sweetness, or extreme bitterness. Um, these are entirely recipe derived off flavors. Uh, so starting out with cloying sweetness, um, this is when the beer is finished fermentation, but its final gravity is so high still that it ends up being overpoweringly sweet and it's just not a tasty beer to drink. Um, usually if your final gravity is somewhere in like north of 1020 or 1025, and your beer is not already eight or 10% alcohol, this is going to be a cloyingly sweet beer. So what you want to do to avoid this is avoid having too many uh, unfermentable sugars or complex sugars in the grist. So for example, that's like lactose and dextrin malt and also lots of caramel malts can cause a cloying sweetness. So try to avoid using those. It also can happen if you use uh, the wrong kind of yeast. So certain English strains of yeast cannot ferment maltotriose, which is a complex sugar that other types of yeasts can actually metabolize. So like when I used uh, Windsor yeast in my holiday ale, it only got down to like uh, 1018, I think was the final gravity or 1020. And that caused it to have a nice residual sweetness because that maltotriose was still in there. However, if I was brewing a different beer that didn't have so many spices in it, it would have been unbalanced and it would have been overly sweet and it would have been difficult to drink. Now you can get rid of this problem by, in most cases, pitching in a more aggressive yeast, something that's diastatic as positive, like a Saison strain or perhaps some champagne yeast if you really need to get it dry. Um, and that will ferment some of those more unfermentable sugars. Uh, but also just be sure when you're making your recipe, you're designing it, use some brewing software that shows you what the estimated final gravity is. If it's way too high because you're adding in so many caramel malts or roasted malts and unfermentables, it's gonna probably be a problem. And on the flip side, over bittering your beer. Um, this is adding too many bittering hops or potentially adding in too many roasted malts that have their own bitterness associated with them or adding in spices that are bitter um, or having a beer that finishes really, really dry but has a lot of hops in it, that's gonna cause additional bitterness because it's not balanced with the sweetness. You wanna look at the bitterness unit to gravity unit ratio. Um, which is the ratio of your IBUs, which are a calculated bitterness unit, and gravity points, or your specific gravities. That ratio is definitely a very flexible thing, but if you have an extreme bitterness unit to gravity unit ratio, you're gonna probably have a pretty bitter and potentially unpalatable beer. So that's just something to look into. Make sure you're balancing your hops, balancing your ingredients, and uh, not adding too many things to the beer to make it extra bitter. Be sure you're taking a good look at the alpha acid content of your hops, and again, if you're using brewing software to help you out with your recipes, be sure to update the alpha acids 
uh, on your hop additions in the brewing software because oftentimes they're very different than what the established kind of baseline alpha acid is in the brewing software you might have used to create your recipe. So once again, just to recap, 99% of these beer off flavors are gonna be prevented by just using good sanitation practices, good brewing practices, and pitching enough yeast and letting your beer sit long enough to eventually metabolize or condition uh, off of those off flavors. I hope this video was useful and if you enjoyed it, please go ahead, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button as well if you haven't already and comment down below with your thoughts. If you've ever had an off flavor in your beer and done something unique to get rid of it and it worked, let us know, because there's probably something out there that I missed. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one down in my merchandise store. You can find that down below the description box or in the description box as well. If you want to support me in other ways, I also have a Patreon. My patrons are really helpful in helping make this channel what it is now, helping upgrade the production quality and all that good stuff. So thank you for your support there. I also have a channel membership option Option for one or two bucks a month if you're curious about that and then also there's the super thanks button as well which is a great way to show me support really quickly I have an Amazon store where you can find a bunch of the brewing equipment that I use on the regular that I recommend it's on Amazon I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook now as the apartment brewer so check those links out for some more frequent content than just YouTube and so last but certainly not least if you are still here thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video it means a lot to me and I really appreciate it because sometimes these can get kind of long. So thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. And until the next one, so it goes out to you. Cheers.